good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, my name is Tamara Kharoub. I'm the Assistant Executive Director and Senior Fellow at Arab Center, Washington, D.C. I would like to welcome you all to um, today's webinar titled Tunisia's Constitutional Crisis and Yearning for Democracy in Northwest Africa, um, where we plan to discuss uh, the recent development in Tunisia and the state of democracy in the North Africa, in the Northwest Africa region, uh, specifically focusing on Algeria, Libya, Morocco, and of course, um, Tunisia. As you all know, um, last week, Tunisian President um, Qais Sayed fired the prime minister and suspended parliament in um, what some have called a coup. Uh, the move followed nationwide protests demanding the premier's uh, resignation and the dissolution of parliament, especially following um, the coronavirus outbreak and, and collapse of the healthcare system and uh, worsening economic conditions. Uh, meanwhile, in Algeria, the recent parliamentary elections um, served to entrench electoral authoritarianism. Um, Libya's interim government of national unity faces a multitude of challenges, especially um, with the elections planned for December of this year. All while uh, Morocco's claim to democratic reform confronts continuing uh, monarchical and military authoritarian rule. At this um, critical juncture uh, for democracy in the region, and in light of developments in Tunisia, the site of Arab, Arab Springs only relative uh, democratic success story, we at Arab Center Washington DC sought to organize this webinar to discuss the status of democratization in Northwest Africa, specifically, as I mentioned, focusing on Tunisia, Algeria, Libya, and Morocco, and to consider the challenges and opportunities, um, whether domestic, regional, or international, to the process of, of democratization and reform and provide some policy recommendations to support democratic governance across the region. Um, to explore these issues, uh, we are very pleased to have a great panel of experts um, who have taken the time and agreed to provide their insights uh, today. Um, I would like to draw your attention in case you haven't noticed uh, to the fact that um, today's panel is an all female panel. Um, if you have been following our work, um, you might know or uh, you may have observed that it is our policy to maintain a gender balance um, in our programs. And we have been proactive in highlighting uh, the analyses of female experts and scholars. And this is not to say that we don't value um, the contributions of male experts, as some might say or think, but um, because there's been um, traditionally a disproportionate makeup of, of programs, panels, discussion groups, and task forces and committees when it comes to policy conversations, and specifically um, regarding the Middle East and North Africa region. And so we are here, um, our goal is to provide a balance to this conversation by including more female experts and more voices from the region. So I'm very pleased uh, to present today's distinguished panel of excellent experts that happen to be all women. Um, I would like to thank all of them, uh, the speakers for today, for taking the time to join us and to contribute their expertise to this important discussion. And I very much look forward to their insights and analyses. We are also very grateful um, to have Rima Abu Hamdiye, who graciously agreed to chair the discussion. Uh, Rima is a presenter and reporter uh, for Al Arabi Television Network, and she's a very good friend of Arab Center Washington, D.C. Thank you, Rima, as well, for um, agreeing to uh, share this conversation. Um, with that, I will not take any more time. I will turn it over to Rima to chair the discussion, introduce the panelists, and um, take care of this conversation. Rima? Hello, everyone. Good day, and I hope you're having... Um a great um, morning. Um, it's morning in Washington, DC. And thank you for joining us to this important webinar on the current situation in Tunisia. And I plan to say thank you. Um, and I'm honored to be part of this um, um, webinar this morning being all female uh, panelists, but I'll, I'll start with this. I'm 
uh, particularly honored to be part of this discussion and to moderate such an incredible discussion. I know it's going to be incredible with such distinguished uh, panelists, all females, all experts in their fields. Um, Tunisia is the cradle of the Arab Spring, but now it's facing constitutional and governing crisis after the Tunisian president took drastic measures including the suspension of the parliament and sacking of the prime minister using article 80 of the constitution to justify these moves. Many have called these measures a coup. Others are still struggling to define these uh, moves, but in all cases, those measures came after nationwide protests demanding that the prime minister resign from his office and the par parliament is desolated. While the country suffered immensely from the coronavirus outbreak and its a health and its health system was on the verge of collapsing. In a region where the Arab Spring has failed to find its way through to regime and governance change in many Arab countries, Tunisia was the only hope for success. A lesson many hoped would prove that democracy is actually functional. The last measures, however, many fear, have put this hope to rest as they equate what happens in Tunisia to other countries mainly what happens in Egypt, while others argue that the situation in Tunisia cannot be likened to that in other countries. For unions and civil society organizations in Tunisia stand tall against the country slipping into a dictatorship and total disregard of the rule of law. To discuss all of this and um, the state of democratization, as Tamara said, in the region and the progress towards democracy in Algeria, Libya, and Morocco, and the impact um, the developments in Tunisia have or has on those countries. We have the list, as I said, of impressive uh, panelists. We'll start with Khawla bin uh, uh, Gaisi, a Tunisian journalist, who will talk to us about the implications and risks to democracy of the recent, of the recent move by the president. Also with us, Dalia Ghanem Yazbek, a resident scholar, Carnegie Middle East Center, who will talk to us about democracy in Algeria and Northwest Africa and the challenges to a democratic process after waves of protest. Also with us, Yasmina Abu Zuhur, a visiting fellow of Brookings Doha Center, who will talk to us about Morocco's state of democracy and monarchical survival. And last but not least, Tahani al Mughrabi, international development specialist and Libya expert, Coleman International, who will talk to us about the political process in Libya, prospects for the government of national unity, civil war, and external interventions and influence. We will hear from all of our distinguished panelists about the impact of developments in Tunisia on those countries, Morocco, Algeria, and Libya. And once again, I want to emphasize that I'm particularly honored to be part of a um, panel that is all female experts. And with that, I um, uh, give it uh, uh, to you to talk to us about Tunisia, Khawla Ben Gaisia. Uh, thank you so much for having me, and I'm sorry for this uh, <laughs> uh, little problem. So uh, in Tunis, before the 25th of July, we asking ourselves as a journalist or social, uh, civil society, how we can make a deep change in Tunisia, how we can really make a deep change inside the parliament and inside the government. But always we think in, in this change, something from the constitution, not something outside. But in 25 of, of July, after the president's um, decision, we asked ourselves what happened in Tunisia, what the president tried to do. And now in these days and after 10 days of his decision, we said, what's next, what's the future? We are, because we are really walking into the unknown. Um, let's talk about numbers. Let's talk about what happened really to let the president today take his decision. For, for example, in Tunis, we have 463 files of corruption against businessmen. And, and these files since the revolution, not new. The social demands did not stop. The politicians were silent, condemning them for the demands of the people who elected them and trusted them. And according to the National Institute of Statistics in Tunisia, there are more than 670,000 unemployed, 
compared in 2018, the number was 644,000. The economic growth of minus minus three percent. The inflation rate reached 5.7 percent. All this accumulation and the parliament presented a negative image of the people and of the country and all the revolution in Tunis. So these are the reasons that precipitate the current crisis. So our crisis, it's not just one year or two years, it's since the revolution until now. In, two, in 25 of July, the president Saeed Said considered himself the guardian of the Tunisian constitution and that he was the one who made the decision to use any legal chapter in it. So therefore he took the chapter 18 and told us, I will apply this chapter to block all process of 10 years. All what happened in 10 years, I said in one hour, he delayed everything. So, but a lot of people said, okay, you want to, to do a deep change in, in the Tunisian uh, uh, political class? Okay, what's your, your road plan? What you have next? What's your plan for, for, for our democracy? So uh, wasn't you, Yanni, in the same time, we asking him, wasn't you able to find a, a, a consensual legal solution other than broke these 10 years? Because these 10 years, we have a lot of things. In, in these 10 years, there's a lot of people die. We have a new constitution. We have, we have a, a process, a whole process. So uh, what's really until today, we're asking him, what's your road plan for our democracy? Because the Article 18 itself says that state institutions, including parliament, remain in working condition. But this does not exist today because the president has freezing the functions of the parliament and dismissed the government. The law also says that it's very important to appoint a prime minister and a government. And until now, we don't have a government and we don't have a prime minister. Today, we, our yeah, in reality, we are without constitutional institutions, without government, without a road plan. Only what we have, we have a man in the Carthage Palace and we try to say some speeches, some videos, that's it. And in reality, we have nothing. The country, it's empty. And with all this process, after the 25th of July, uh, some people said it's a coup and some people said it's uh, necessary for the country and uh, the proof that there is a lot of people they are happy of this decision. But a lot of Tunisian party, they are against this decision and a lot of organization too. And a lot of them ask the president, what's next? And in this question, there is no answer until now. So until now we have Kai Said monopolizes three powers, the legislative, the executive and judicial powers. And really today uh, we need uh, all these uh, political parties with the president. Like usual, we need them to stay in the same table and agree in something. Because today there's a lot of people said in Tunis after 30 days, uh, the president he will um, give his decision to the parliament go again at work and he will choose another uh, government. So if, if, if after these days we will go back again to the same, uh, 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 to the, our normal life. So why he take this decision? Why he did all of this? Uh, 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 this, this uh, why he did all of these problems to let the, the country in the unknown path? So really, today it's it's a, a big problem uh, uh, in Tunisia, and it's a real problem in the, our democracy way. Uh, this model in the region in the North Africa. And our problem, it's not just our problem in Tunis, because we have our neighborhood in Libya, in Algeria, what happened in between Algeria and Morocco. So what happened in Tunis, it's not just happened in Tunis. 
it's uh, it's 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 um, it's a picture and the image of all the, re the region. So and because this, a lot of friends of Tunisia, a lot of countries have the Tunisia model. They need to be succeed. So what happened today? What I said did. It's uh, it's really put the country it's in the unknown road, in the unknown future. And we feel that today. A lot of people said, okay, but a lot of people are happy of this decision. The people who are happy of the decision of Thai Said, there are two groups. First group, who is uh, my friends, who is uh, uh, go outside with the revolution, and they are really ask of a deep change in Tunis and because the country needs this change. And I can understand them. And another group, they are the same group who are against the revolution in Tunis, who are against all uh, 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 the process since the revolution of Tunis. The same people who are, who are happy today of the decision of Kais Said, they are the same people who said, this man is crazy, and this man is the new Qaddafi in Tunis, the new Qaddafi in the region. And today, unfortunately, we're talking about not just Qais Said, because Qais Said, uh, there's no uh, uh, political party with him. Or So a lot of people said today, Qais Said is not alone, because there is another, maybe uh, another country support him to his decision. And this country, uh, they are always against the revolution in Tunis and the Arab Spring in the region. So it's a really crease in Tunis. It's a really problem. We try to ask him what's next and we try to uh, figure what uh, the road plan of Thai Said. Thank you, Khawla, thank you. Stay with us for the questions and I'm okay. just gonna remind um, I'm going to remind the participants, the viewers, if they have any questions, please send yeah. them to um, the email or in the Q&A feature on Zoom link. The email is events at arabcenterdc.org. Um, Dahlia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rima. Let me put my timer so I would be, you know, concise. Uh, so on what happened in Tunisia, uh, Algeria has been, you know, uh, faithful to its policy of non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries. Uh, so it refrained from speaking out publicly uh, on the political crisis that is shaking neighboring Tunisia. Since Qais Saeed announcement to suspend parliament and dismiss the government, the Algerian and Tunisian uh, presidents are believed, according to local media, uh, to have spoken on the phone twice. Uh, and also, uh, after between these talks, Foreign Minister uh, Ramtan Lamamra traveled to Tunis on Tuesday, 27th, <laughs> and where he met his Tunisian counterpart and also the President Qais Saeed. Of course, Lam uh, Ramtan Lamamra reiterated Algeria's non interference by saying a few days after when he visited uh, Cairo and he met his uh, Egyptian counterpart, Sam Hassan Shukri, we respect Tunisia's sovereignty and stand in solidarity with the country. So there is no surprise here. Algeria is uh, sticking um, to its uh, foreign policy of non-interference. I believe the country will continue, though, to follow what's going on in neighboring Tunisia, because what happens in Tunisia has a direct uh, impact on uh, uh, what happens in Algeria. This is a country with which uh, we share uh, a thousand kilometers of border. But Algeria is very preoccupied with its internal affairs that looks a lot like what's going on in, in neighboring Tunisia. Uh, look, for instance, how the south of both countries, for instance, Tatawin for the case of Tunisia and Wergla for the case of Algeria have been demonstrating lately. So where is Algeria standing today? What are the challenges of the North African behemoth, if I may say? On the political level, I believe that, you know, since the departure of Bouteflika, many analysts and many uh, scholars have been asking the same question as the question is whether change happened or no in Algeria. The answer to that, and I am usually a very optimistic person, but here I am not. The answer to that is that now uh, uh, the new Algeria looks a lot like the old Algeria. Uh, the military remain the real locust 
of power in Algeria. Not only they played a crucial role in ousting Bouteflika in April 2019, but they also piloted the transition, if I may say. Uh, the military organized a presidential election, chose the civilian that they wanted in the person of Abdel Majid Taboun, a former prime minister, as well as they chose the chief of staff, Saeed Shingriha, who replaced Gaid Saleh after his death uh, in December 2019. And they organized a referendum for a new constitution as well as legislative elections. First, by choosing President Boone and putting him in place um, and putting in place uh, an elected government, the military re-established the usual facade of democracy with its constitutionalism and pluralism. It protected its national reputation and internal cohesion. Second, once the civilian facade was was established, the army rehabilitated the intelligence services and reshuffled the security services to maintain its power. It's very important, for instance, to know that since uh, August 2019 until uh, recently, there have been a lot of reshuffling within the military, within the gendarmerie and within the intelligence uh, services. So so um, uh, the, the relationship between the presidency that grew stronger under President Bouteflika and the military shifted today for the benefit of the military. And like Bouteflika, President Taboon does not cultivate any uh, grudge against the military and he has no scores uh, to settle with the army. Moreover, his lack of legitimacy in the eyes of a population that largely rejected him in a difficult situation in which he placed him in a difficult situation in which he needs the support of the military. So in a nutshell, to finish on the political level, I would say that in Algeria, the military continued to rule the country while the civilian facade governed. The military will continue to rule behind the civilian facade for the foreseeable future in Algeria. On the economic level, what's going on in Algeria? As a hydrocarbon rich country dependent on oil and gas for 95% of its export revenues, Algeria is highly, highly vulnerable to fluctuation in oil prices. And actually the economy was for performing really poorly even before the pandemic hit the country in March, 2020. So to, be, to, to, to try to manage the health crisis, well, while compensating for the sharp decline in oil export revenues, the government is drawing or has been drawing on its foreign exchange reserves and is likely to continue doing so as the pandemic is dragging on. Over the past six years, the reserve, the exchange reserves of Algeria has been dramatically depleted, falling uh, dramatically. They went from uh, 194 billion in 2013 to today, they are standing at 42 billion. And this is catastrophic for an economy that was already uh, doing and performing poorly. In this increasing difficult fiscal environment, the Algerian government has begun to, ma to make cuts, of course, without really calling them cuts because they don't want to worry the population. But the fact is that uh, the, the Algerian authorities misused the surplus that they accumulated during the 2000s when the barrel was flirting with the $132. And so they over spent without clear priorities in an effort to buy social peace. This is, for instance, what of the reasons why the Arab Spring did not took place, take place sorry, in Algeria in 2011. But today, again, uh, you know, this strategy of the stick and the carrot is no longer viable for a population that has been increasingly frustrated. And today the carrot is no longer available. So buying social, pe social peace is going to be very hard for the government. I will finish on the social level. Uh, the Hirak did not stop its mobilization despite repressive measures. While the authorities want to push for the narrative according to which it stopped and it is now only located in the Kabylia, the Kabili hinterland, the reality is different. As the authorities have been closing, closing access to the capital, people can no longer demonstrate. And 
actually demonstration have been criminalized. So we are really in a in a pattern of escalation when it comes to uh, repression. And in addition to this, one has to note that the south of Algeria, with the provinces such as Wergla, In Saleh, Taman Rasset, and so on and so forth, are awakening again, if I may say, like they did a decade ago. So one of these southern resource region is Wergla that witnessed a violent crash uh, clashes with the security forces. So finally, my conclusion, and I would stop on that, respecting my 12 minutes, I do believe that the lack of trust between citizens and their civilian institution has led to a total inability of political institution to respond to people's demands. Therefore, attempts to reform Algeria's civilian political sphere succumb to military intervention, a situation that is likely to continue in the short to medium term. For a majority of Algerians today, the political military, military leadership brought to power a president whose job is to preserve those entered with interest and not to negotiate with the Hirak or with the people and move toward a more democratic Algeria. Algeria. As a result, the military risks being seen more and more as an agent of stagnation and repression in the service of a repudiated political leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Dalia. That was very inclusive. Um, and uh, Morocco and the situation in Morocco and how different it is, maybe, or not different than the rest of the neighboring countries with Yasmina Abu Zuhur, Doha Center, in um, Brookings, Doha Center. Hello. Um, so two things come to mind when thinking about North Africa 10 years after the Arab Spring. First, 10 years later, it remains clear that the desire to change the status quo is still there. We've seen this through a massive contestation across the board in Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, whether it's online in protest through a boycott, also through this increased desire um, to emigrate, and finally through public opinion data like in the Arab Barometer. And the second thing is, as a whole, North Africa today doesn't look much better than it did before the Arab Spring. Um, so, in fact, the focus of activists today is no longer the traditional democratization versus liberalization argument. It's even the liberalization process has been stalled or is problematic, meaning there have been restrictions not just on the public's ability to directly influence the political sphere, but also on its individual freedoms and its ability to participate in the public sphere. So looking at Morocco more closely, last February marked 10 years since the Arab Spring-related protests. Um, and these protests had resulted in some political reforms. Most notably, the legislative branch was partially empowered by requiring that the prime minister be uh, selected from the party that won the largest share of votes, votes in the elections, not by the monarch directly. Furthermore, the Justice and Development Party, the PJD, which is an Islamist party, entered the government for the first time uh, in the country's history. And for context, it had been kept out of government for decades. Even looking before the Arab Spring, there had been some political and civil liberties, uh, the most famous of which was the reform to the 2004 Constitution, uh, Family Code, which led to uh, positive changes in terms of women's rights. For example, raising the marriage age to 18 years old, um, granting women self-guardianship, child custody, so on and so forth. There were some caveats, but this remained an important step. Since then, however, the political reforms that were expected by many in civil society and the protest movement did not come about. For example, changes to the inheritance law, the legalization of abortion, uh, the abolishment of the death penalty, uh, greater freedom of expression, things like that. In terms of political freedoms, the electoral process has been more transparent than it was 20 years ago. There is less evidence of rigged elections and regime interference. And on the individual level, the current king's reign has been marked by less brutal repression than his predecessors. Now we can look at it this way. Regimes in North Africa often play the comparison game. During the Arab Spring, we heard at least it's not as bad as in Libya, it's not as brutal as Bashar, so on and so forth. But when you look at relative terms and the data, when comparing Morocco, which is a non-absolute monarchy, to an absolute monarchy like Saudi Arabia, it's clear that Morocco is doing better in terms of human rights and political freedoms. 
Now take Morocco and compare it to Spain, which is a constitutional democratic monarchy, things are different. Why? Quite simply, the structures and the institutions that allow and facilitate political opening do exist in Morocco. We can't deny that. There's a parliament, there's a strong civil society, so on and so forth. However, liberal, uh, political opening, liberalization remain restricted at the top. Looking at the data, Morocco's freedom of repression um, ratings have not changed since over the last decade, actually over the last two decades. And on a related note, some argue that the biggest form or, or example of political opening took place 20 years ago when a socialist opposition member was allowed to become prime minister, Abdurrahman Yusufi. Now, I'm not going to stack up the Yusufi opening to the Pijid Day opening in 2011 and compare them. I don't think it's the point. I think what the point is, however, is that both openings came from the top 20 years ago and 20 years later. In terms of wider restrictions uh, and constraints in Morocco, like in most MENA monarchies, most MENA regimes, the post-Arab Spring period has been characterized by heightened repression, uh, more restrictions on freedom of rights, more arrests of activists and journalists, and so on and so forth. This may be because the regimes are more sensitive to this desire to change the status quo, these drivers of contestation they have not been able to address, or it may be because their perception of threat after 2011 has transformed to encompass more. On the level of governance, um, the two greatest changes since 2011 came around elections. The first one, which I mentioned, which saw the Pejidi come to lead the government. And the second election, 2016, um, in which administration-backed parties formed a coalition and blocked the Pejidi from implementing any reforms, thereby diminishing its influence in government. Now, in the face of these issues, some compare the current state of affairs today to 10 years ago in 2011 and argue that it's worse and the uh, process of reform seems to have collapsed altogether. However, I would not be so quick to say that. I think there's still some hope. Um, as long as the regime has not tipped over to the brutal violence of the Gaddafi regime, I'm going to say, there is still the chance right now to de-escalate the situation, to dialogue with opposition actors and the wider population. And the first step towards achieving this is bringing about concrete political opening through genuinely empowering the legislative branch, something which the regime has avoided doing so far. Now, first, the one must limit interference in government affairs by certain actors. And second, there must be an effective division of tasks between regime and government. And while this would not lead to democratization, at the very least, given time, it would result in genuine liberalization. I'll end briefly uh, on the question of the implications of what's happening in Tunisia on Morocco and the wider region. For Morocco, I would say the concern at the top is less about politics and more about security. Um, if things escalate. In fact, the Moroccan Foreign Minister Nasser Bourita visited President Qais Saeed on July 27th with a message of support from the monarch, indicating that the regime was following events closely um, and that it um, could be worried that complications would escalate if, this, if the situation became serious. As for Morocco's Islamist political actors, and this is the big question because of the Nahda, the prime minister himself refused to comment um, but, and the Pijade itself refused to take position, but other Islamist movements like Le Mur, like Al Ihsan, heavily criticized President Qais Saeed and argued that this was a coup d'etat against democracy. For the wider region, I would say that, of course, the crisis in Tunisia is important, but I would disagree that it is so important that it is now threatening the wider region on either a security or political level. I think this, it's too early to tell, and this depends on the aftermath, what decisions will be taken? Will, will there be parliamentary elections? Will there be a wider dialogue to discuss different scenarios, so on and so forth? Um, I would also note that a lot of these comparisons we're seeing right now, um, or a lot of these worries are expected because Tunisia, like Daria mentioned, was the good story of the Arab Spring. Um, it's the one case we could all point to and say, well, it's worked at some, on some level in one country. And so any obstacle worries people. However, the democratization process is a very slow one that happens over decades, if not centuries. 
comparing Tunisia's nascent democracy to long established democratic systems like we're seeing right now in policy and media circles is not right um, in the sense that it's not a symmetric comparison. Uh, consider that France took over one century and a half, 160 years exactly, to transform from the revolution to the Fifth Republic. Um, and think about that. So I will end here and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Yasmina. That was um, great. And um, our last panelist for this um, amazing discussion is Tehani Mograbi, International Development Specialist and Libya expert, who will tell us more about um, the impact of what happened in Tunisia on Libya, but also the situation in Libya and the internal fighting and the prospects maybe of um, dialogue or a peaceful settlement to the ongoing civil war in Libya. Thank you, Rima, and thank you, everyone. Um, if I may, uh, I would like to start by putting some remarks on what happened in Tunisia and just take a step by step to Libya and what's going on there. Um, so as an observer uh, to what happened, I think uh, the recent events in Tunisia can be labeled as a collapse of public order and democratic process or as a political crisis for potential growth. Uh, I still don't fully agree with the narrative describing it as coup d'etat because perhaps it's too soon to say, as everybody rightfully said. Uh, in my opinion, uh, this is a political clash between government branches, uh, similar to what is happening in Libya, but not necessarily the same level. Um, it is important also to state that Tunisia has a mature middle class that produces cautious action. The country has powerful unions, especially the Tunisian uh, General Labor Union. It has a very well-developed uh, civil society. All these combined with non-governmental actors are likely to play a crucial role in this crisis. Historically, uh, this particular group of people believe in dialogue as a means to solve such crises and do not have any interest in uh, domestic clashes or security conflicts, in particular during a time of pandemic. Uh, I would assume the goal is always to adjust the road of democracy and to advocate for better life for Tunisian citizens. Um, I would like to quote my colleague Karim Mizran here when he said that democracy is a process of a bumpy road. Uh, um, indeed, it is a bumpy road, and it includes years of building trust, economic growth, etc. Uh, so when we talk um, on other international actors, especially the ones in the region, how they reacted to it, uh, some of them, such Egypt, UAE, and Saudi Arabia, uh, privately welcomed what uh, President Qais Saeed uh, did because it serves their uh, interest to limit the influence of uh, Islamists in Tunisia, including uh, the Nahda party and other actors such as uh, Qatar and Turkey who have expressed their concerns about uh, Saeed's move to suspend the parliament. However, both um, Turkey and Qatar are currently working to normalize their uh, relations with Egypt and Saudi Arabia. So that perhaps will limit their intervention or encourage their intervention to Tunisia to avoid creating new regional tensions that could derail the situation. Um, there is a possibility that President uh, Qais Saeed uh, will come to the table of dialogue and manage to appoint prime minister soon, uh, who is seen as independent, legitimate, um, and then all the accusation of coup may dissipate. Therefore, it is very crucial and important for the international community at the moment to pay attention to what is happening in Tunisia and to encourage dialogue. Now, how could this affect Libya? This could affect Libya only if there would be a collapse of public order in Tunisia, which is highly unlikely in my opinion. Uh, Libya, if that's the case, Libya could struggle with uh, the increase of radical groups uh, coming through the borders. So it's mainly going to be uh, our number one security uh, uh, concerns. In addition, uh, other individuals such as Khalifa Haftar may take advantage of the situation to launch another war, claiming that it's a war on terrorism. Um, we saw immediate reaction uh, within Libya from Khalifa Haftar welcoming what President Qais Saeed uh, did because it speaks to his uh, mindset of one man uh, rule. And also we saw the head of the High State Council, Khalid Dimitri, uh, condemning it. In general, I would say 
with in Libya with all its government bodies at the moment it's uh, the focus is more on the political dialogue uh, putting the constitutional framework together elections preparation for December 24 and the recent appearance of Saif al-Islam Gaddafi and whether that was actually him or someone else um, to this particular effect, I don't think there is an appetite to start domestic um, uh, protests, for example, in Libya or for government institutions to clash for now. Uh, regarding the political process uh, aiming for the elections in December, we are still waiting for the LPDF to agree on a constitutional framework for the elections. There have been several setbacks in the process, but it is still going as the Prime Minister Hamid Beba stated in his statement to the Security Council that the government of national unity is still working uh, for the elections to happen and to take place in December 24th. Uh, the High National Election Commission in, um, increased the deadline or extended the deadline for uh, voting registration until mid of this month. Uh, so what is still unknown uh, now is whether there will be presidential and parliamentary elections in Libya in December at the same time or one after the other. Uh, and there is also the possibility of doing the constitution referendum first. Um, although elections uh, in Libya will not necessarily solve all problems as we have seen historically, especially without having a national constitution uh, in place to determine the form of government, power separation, et cetera, um, without having also a guaranteed political buy-in from all parties and individuals to accept the uh, elections results. Um, elections still considered as the only solution or the way out for Libya to go to its next chapter. The possibility for another armed conflict to erupt in, uh, is very high in Libya for a number of reasons. Uh, for example, the absence of uh, unified security forces, a uh, possibility of not having presidential elections where key individuals could actually react violently to that uh, or simply losing the elections like what happened in 2014. Um, I would like to um, end here by saying that what happened in Tunisia could actually, and depending on you know the, the process uh, that we are observing day by day, uh, that actually could have a positive effect on Libya and set a good example for solving political crisis through dialogues instead of armed conflicts and military means. Thank you, Tahani. That was great. And I'm getting questions on the Q&A um, feature on um, Zoom. If anybody um, have uh, questions, please send them along. And I will start with this question. And I think it, it's repeated um, a few times, but um, it's basically about um, what happened in Tunisia and the similarities of what happened in Tunisia versus what happened in other countries. Um, the first question comes from Joan Mason. Parallels have been made between Tunisia's present situation in which its democracy is being tested and Egypt after 2011 when democracy had a flicker of life but then ended empathetically with the rise of Abdel Fattah Sisi. A broader question is whether, it's whether it is democracy that failed in Tunisia or was it the failure of the government to meet the needs of the people? And again, he sends the question, I should have asked, is that parallel, is that parallel between Tunisia and Egypt valid? Khawla, I'll, I'll turn this question to you. Is the parallel between Tunisia and Egypt valid? Uh, yeah, about Tunisia and Egypt, this is the first question after, in 25 July. What happened in, in Egypt will be happened in Tunis? Uh, no, it's not uh, uh, real. Uh, to, to the same scenario happened in, in, in Egypt it can be happened in Tunis. Because first of all, the society is different. Tun Tunisia is a small country. It's the population, the society, it's, it's different than Egypt. This is for second. Uh, the military in Tunis uh, always he is neutral. He is never including in the um, uh, politic uh, problems. However, Kais Said in this in this crisis he tried to to give the to to, to let them uh, the military uh, in the streets uh, against uh, the people. But 
uh, historical, the military in Tunis always is outside the, uh, the political uh, problems. In same time, uh, uh, our Tunisian neighborhood, Libya, Algeria, Morocco, is different than the Middle East area. When you have uh, Algeria as a neighborhood or Libya, it's not the same when you have Israel in your neighborhood. Or, so the geopolitical um, uh, uh, um, uh, situation is, is, is very important in this case. But in same time, uh, the, the Egypt scenario, a little bit happened in Tunis with this crease, but, but slowly with, um, with uh, for example, what, um, the decision of Tai Said, after that, the people who come to the street, after that, there is um, uh, a Tunisian uh, artist who have a song about uh, what happened and to prove that she supports Tai Said. So this scenario, it's it's little bit same, the Egypt, but, um, but not, for example, Egypt, it's, it's, it's um, what happened, it's, it's so strong. And uh, in the same time, the, the uh, American decision or the American opinion about what happened in Tunis today, it's different than in Obama, uh, um, in Obama uh, regime and, and his opinion about uh, what happened uh, in, in Egypt. So the scenario is a little bit different. And until now, 10 days after, what, after 25th of July, and the people outside and the military and all the, the political society try to asking, try to have some solutions. That's it. So this, until now, we don't have this uh, full uh, Egypt uh, scenario. So uh, at the same time, uh, on 26th July, Algeria and uh, Morocco um, they visit Tunisia and they said we support Tunisia and we and it's impossible to try to to see the Egypt or the Middle East scenario in the region in the North Africa and this is so important. So because of that all of this it's um, um, let's make sure that Tunisia tries to find a peace solution uh, without uh, blood and without uh, more and more crisis. Thank you, Khala. Before I turn it to another, uh, and if I can ask you to mute yourself, please. Before I turn it to, uh, uh, before I get another question from the audience, I'm gonna ask Dahlia uh, a follow-up question um, on the parallels between Egypt and, um, between Egypt and Tunisia and also maybe Algeria, if you can put that into context. And the reason I'm um, re-emphasizing the question is because of the military role in all of these countries and the military facade. Yes, we have presidents, but at the same time, um, who's really controlling the institutions. At the same time, is there a void of um, uh, institutions in Tunis right now, the way we saw also in other countries, namely Egypt, after Sisi took uh, power. Also, the you know the taking over power in Egypt was slowly, and now it's consolidated in one hand. Um, and there are fears now Tunisia is headed into that direction. Do you agree with this analysis that a lot are sharing, at least here in the West? I think the, the, the entire Arab region countries are sharing some commonalities, but I would say those commonalities in, for instance, the, the thirst of the, uh, the, the, the people for more democracy, for social justice, for more human rights, but I don't really see it in the regimes. Of course, there is some commonalities, but talking about Tunisia, Tunisia was never a military state, uh, even under Benali, c'était un état policier, yes, but it wasn't a military state. Uh, the military never played an important role in uh, Tunisian politics. On the opposite, they always remained pretty you know, neutral about it. When it comes to Algeria, it's different. This is a military that has been actually uh, that was born uh, from the fight, uh, the fight, sorry, against um, for independence of Algeria, uh, 1954-62, and so as a revolutionary army at the independence of the country, the army identifies with the nation. It is the nation, uh, and as such, there is the, this ethos, this corporatist military ethos that see uh, uh, see itself as being the protect, the guardian of the 
nation. And so they cannot trust civilians with uh, a politics to give them all the political arena to do what in their head that they did in 1992. And so Algeria's history is a history of military coup, call them coup after or no, after another. Uh, we had a, a, a country that was run by the military after the independence. Okay, it was one party system, the FLN, but still we do know that the FLN was totally uh, sidelined by, uh, by uh, Boumedjian when he took uh, power in 65, it was a coup against Bin Billa. Here we have the first military jumping in politics. Then we have 1989 with Shedli Bin Jdid uh, saying this is the liberalization of the country, multi-party system and in Fitah economically. And then we had the 1992 coup, the military intervened, interrupted the electoral process to avoid an overwhelming victory of the Islamic Salvation Front, and they took effective control of the country. Then we have an entire decade when the military played a crucial role in the fight against terrorism, 1992-2002. And then we have the military again during this decade, not only they played a role in the fight against terrorism, but they took, as I said, effective country, uh, control of the country. They brought uh, uh, Mohamed Boudiaf, he was killed. They brought Yamin Zerwal, they pushed him out. They brought Bouteflika. So there isn't one important crucial decision that is taken in Algeria without the military. I don't think this is the case in Tunisia. I think we are in a totally different scenario. When it comes to Egypt, my knowledge of Egypt is not that uh, as, as deep as when it comes to Algeria. But I would say the similarities is that we had a strong military institution. And as a matter of strong, uh, as a matter of fact, the Egyptian military can be seen even as more stronger. Why? Because when you compare the involvement of the Algerian military in the economic sector and with its uh, Egyptian culture counterpart, we have huge differences. 75% of uh, the economy is ho uh, held by the military, according to experts such as Yazid Sayer. And so here again, we have differences. So I would, I would be careful with uh, what can be compared and what cannot be. But again, uh, bottom line, Tunisia has never been a military state. The military has never played a, a crucial role in politics. And I don't see how this is going really uh, to change. Rima, we can't hear you. You are off. You are oh, muted. Because I muted myself. Is there any proof? This question comes from Gesser, Gesser Al Anwar. Is there any proof of Egyptian or Emirates hands in what happened in Tunisia? And before I turn the mic to somebody else, there is another question that's similar. So um, I'll just uh, put them together. You mentioned foreign interests influencing meddling Tunisia's crisis. Who are these? And might and might be their agenda. UAE, KSA, the country that sheltered Ben Ali, Qatar, Turkey, Egypt, EU, and USA come to mind, but others. Also, doesn't Qais Saeed have the authority to fire ministers that he himself appointed, but who have gone rogue allying with parliamentary blocs, not equating the two, but how many people did Trump fire during his presidency? And everyone treated it as odd, but idiocentric. Uh, business as usual and not a coup d'etat. I'm um, I'm gonna first maybe the first part can be answered by Tahani and the second by uh, Yasmina, um, especially because Libya is also has also suffered from meddling of regional and international forces in its uh, business. Do you see any um, maybe indications that what happened in Tunisia is actually the result of meddling from outside forces and what? would these forces be? So uh, this is a very interesting question, especially that same, you know, I would say meddling uh, factors or uh, involved countries that you mentioned are the same uh, involved in, um, in Libya. Uh, as a quick answer, I don't necessarily agree that they, you know, whether UAE, uh, uh, Turkey, you name it, uh, have any, um, uh, you know, um, 
reasons to uh, be meddling in this uh, at the moment. Uh, what I, I uh, what happened in Tunisia, if we go back to the previous before, uh, you know, uh, July 25th, and according to what uh, even Khawla rightfully said, there there were so many things happening that led to this: the, the collapse of the health system, the economic situation, uh, the the government's failure to respond to people's needs. All of that combined. Uh, uh, caused huge frustration uh, and was a, a good incentive for the people to come out to the street. So I think that was uh, valid and legit for people to come out to the street. However, uh, when it comes to the action that uh, President Saeed um, did, he also had issues dealing with the legislative uh, um, problems with his prime minister because he fired a number of his uh, friends, uh, ministers, and uh, President Saeed refused even to um, swear in the new ministers that the, the prime minister appointed. So there were a number of reasons that led to what happened on July 25th. Uh, and that was, uh, and I would say President Qais Saeed took advantage of that. So that's why I would say it's too soon to say that perhaps UAE, Egypt, or Saudi Arabia um, uh, have any uh, involvement in, in this. And uh, again, yeah, too soon to say. I think as we observe the situation, what's going to happen, whether uh, the Tunisian government bodies will come to have uh, a dialogue to solve this situation, uh, whether Qais Saeed will manage to appoint a new prime minister, then all of that will uh, go back to normal. As Khawla said, then what was the reason for doing it in the first place? Uh, perhaps it was a reality check for particularly Qais Saeed to know that this is something you can't just you know, steal away 10 years of you know, uh, pro um, progress uh, after the revolution in Tunisia. So I hope that answered the question. Reality uh, check indeed, probably, especially as there is no roadmap as everybody is saying. Uh, Yasmina, I take the second part of the question to you. Um, is it even fair to compare what happened in Tunis to what Trump was doing with his ministers, given the fact also that uh, Trump had never come close to firing the um, uh, or, you know, um, uh, dismantling the Congress, knowing that he can't, even though maybe he thought about, about it? Um, well, first, I'd just like to add, I, I agree with Tahani, and I think it's important to point out the interest in Libya is and Algeria is are consider, considerably greater than in Tunisia, whether it's the UAE, Qatar, the countries that were mentioned. So this is not, you know, uh, an, an oil wealthy state. There are, of course, inter political interests and there's preference. Some countries prefer uh, Islamist governments. Others prefer strong men. We all know who those are. But just the sheer involvement, I don't see that here in Tunisia compared to Libya. Um, as for the second question, it, it's an interesting question. I think a lot of people um, enjoy comparing Trump to dictators. Uh, I think, but looking at it uh, as a political scientist, just the system of checks and balances is, is existent in the United States and far more pronounced. I think the fear here in Algeria is, um, although this was a year long political crisis and some argue that President Qais Saeed had to come to this, that he had to get the country out of paralysis. That's what some people are arguing to support him. Um, I would say that the fear is that power is now concentrated uh, within one branch, uh, pending the, the, the choosing a prime minister. And I don't think that was ever the fear uh, under Trump's USA, because there was always a Congress, there was always the Senate. Um, so in that, in, in, that, um, in that way, it wasn't an authoritarian system as we know in political science. Thank you, Yasmina. And, um, uh, a lot of a lot of you were talking about the um, um, the wealth of other countries compared to Tunisia, but I think the way people look at it from um, at least from over here is the perspective that this is the only successful country that actually started a revolution, went through a revolution, had a transfer of power that was relatively peaceful, held elections, maintained the elections. Um, so maybe it's not about the wealth, it's more about the example that Tunisia has put forth to the region that uh, revolutions actually work and could produce 
democratic governance. Uh, but before um, any of you answer to that, let's take another question. And this question is for Dalia. What can be from Dr. Ahmad Harb? Um, what can be said of future of the National Liberation Front in Algeria? Can it provide the necessary political base for what appears to be um, corporatist regime today? Yeah, well, I think if you ask uh, Algerians, a majority of Algerians, at least those to whom I spoke uh, uh, during my last trip uh, during the Hirak in 2019, they would tell you all the same, thank you for your work, but now the FLM belongs to the museum. Uh, so many people are grateful about what they did, what the FLN did uh, for the liberation of the country and post-independence, but many do feel that this historical legitimacy is no longer valid. And as a matter of fact, I do believe that the FLN, as much as the leadership, can no longer play on this historical legitimacy. It's over. People want uh, something else. People are fed up with this, you know, we did for you and we did for the country. And so I would say the FLN, uh, doesn't it doesn't mean though that the FLN is the, uh, is the, uh, is over uh, let me let me hear remember uh, remember the audience and Dr. Imad uh, something that happened in 1997 uh, we were at the height of the civil war and the regime decided that it wanted to resume the electoral process and hence it organized you know election on June 5th 1997 to demonstrate that you know that the Algerian state did not collapse in the face of the Islamists and the institution of the Republic are still working. Uh, President Yamin Zerwal back then, who was elected two years uh, earlier in 1995, needed the docile parliament, but it couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. Why? Because to restore trust between the institution and the people, um, it was not plausible, plausible to give a, um, a victory to the FLN. So what did the regime back then do? He created basically the twin of the FLN with the RND uh, to overcome this problem of FLN's reputation and FLN lack of, of uh, credibility and legitimacy. The regime created four months before uh, the legislative with the help of Zerwell and his supporters and the army, uh, a new party that was called back then the RND, that is still the National Rally for Democracy, that still exists. So this is just to give you an example of the kind of subterfuge that they use when they feel that the main uh, party is uh, is uh, is losing credibility for the latest legislative what did they do for instance they they knew that giving the entire parliament to the fln was not going to give credibility to the parliament that was decreed actually by the population and so they give him enough seat but they played the islamist card and hence the msp came in the second position and so this is the tricks that they will always use you know but bottom line, uh, they will always have a clientele because that will, you know, sustain them because this is a regime that relies heavily on clientelism, on patronage, and on corruption. Corruption is not just, uh, you know, an, a, a, a mistake in the Algerian regime. Corruption is a mechanism of governance. It is, as Mohamed Hashmawi showed it in his brilliant uh, work, c'est un mécanisme de fonctionnement. It's a mechanism of governance, of survival. It is through corruption, uh, corruption sorry, that actually conflicts within this arena, the political arena, are settled. Thank you. Another question about the US. And um, I'm curious to know any possible interference of world powers such as the USA in calming the situation as it always raises its concerns over the political development unfolding worldwide. And if not for the US, who would be its proxy in that part or in this part of the world? This question is from Brazil. Badruddin, and um, before I turn it to the speakers, I'm gonna add the administration um, came short of calling what happened in Tunisia a coup. They're still assessing the situation, but um, at the same time, they are raising their concern, they're uh, expressing concern. Um, just a few minutes ago, Menendezian reached the rank, the, reached the ranking member, and uh, Menendez, the um, chairman of the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee of um, um, of the Senate, 
um, also said that they're concerned over the developments in Tunisia. So there's concern, but also lack of interference, uh, it seems, unlike what um, this question um, is saying. Khawla, what do you say to that? Khawla, you're muted. We can't hear you. Okay, sorry. So, uh, United States, it's like a lot of countries. She liked the Tunisian model. All the country talking about the democracy in the region, the Tunisian model, this country will have Nobel Prize, etc. But in same time, nobody uh, care about what we have really uh, uh, economic crisis, uh, political uh, problems, uh, uh, social uh, problems in same time. So America, until now, uh, she tried to say, um, we try to support the, uh, the Tunisian democracy. We try to uh, see what the President Qais Saeed can uh, do with what, what he's uh, ruled the plan. Uh, so until now, and this is not weird in America because now in Tunis, all the countries try to see uh, the power, the future power, um, it's still in the, uh, Nahda party or some another parts in Tunis or Qais Saeed he will uh, win in his uh, uh, conflict now and he will take all uh, the democracy uh, path in, in Tunis so um, all the countries uh, there is some uh, question talking about there is any proof that for example Egypt or Emirat uh, including in, 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 uh, in Tunisian situation look inside Tunis when after the Qais Saeed decision, the prime minister of, um, uh, the foreign minister of Egypt and Emirat, they visit Tunis and they visit Qais Saeed. Uh, the uh, Saudi ambassador, he visit Qais Saeed in his, uh, in his uh, palace. So this, this picture give us um, um, notes that this country support Qais Saeed, what he did. They never support the Tunisian democracy or they ne never support the Tunisian uh, population. They never talking about what we have as a problems. But now with this de decision, with this crisis, they, they are the first people who visit Tunisia and to, to say, to, to give them support to, uh, to Qais Saeed. Um, so these countries always, uh, their decision it's uh, the interest of this, uh, this of, of these countries however qatar or turkey or uh, uh, any other countries so really our problems now as a tunisian it's really inside tunis our problems first it's with our uh, um, political class it's with our organization it's with our parliament it's with our government we need to find solution inside tunis after that, we will look outside. We will look about America or about the European Union or about any other uh, case. Great, thank you. My um, next questions come from Karim Shaibi, I, I would think. And I, I terribly, I'm terribly sorry if I'm butchering anyone's uh, name. And I'm gonna give this question to uh, Yasmina. Qais Saeed suspended the legislative branch and took over the and took over two plus he took over the, okay, two plus he asked the army to support him and jailed his own prime minister. Why can't we call this coup d'etat? And again, um, a follow-up question also from uh, Karim. The State Department called the coup d'etat in Algeria as a constitutional coup d'etat. I think the scapegoat is to fight Islamists, but Islamists were not in power in Tunisia. Um, Yasmina, what do you say to this? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the comments about Islamists not being in power in Tunisia is interesting because um, they, Nahda is the biggest party and it does have massive influence and massive power in, in parliament. It wasn't, uh, you, you know, the president was not from Nahda, but that doesn't mean that it wasn't powerful. Um, to me, at least the way I see it is that it's a lot more straightforward than it's set out to be. Uh, this was a year-long crisis. There was political paralysis. Qais Saeed made a decision. Um, according to him, something that the Constitution allowed him to do, people disagree. Now, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that when we say authoritarianism, when we say dictatorship, 
this does not fall into it. This is a very different case. And if you look at, you know, Libya under Gaddafi or the UAE or other such countries, um, I think that we're looking at something from like two different species. Um, but again, that depends on how you look at it. Do you think that the constitutional amendment that Qais Saeed based a decision on does give him the power to do what he did or do you not? Um, some people agree with that, some people don't. That's what I would say about this. In terms of um, just going back to the earlier points about foreign interference, which I think is really interesting. Um, so far, there's been no evidence to suggest anything. I think what, what, what there has been evidence uh, of is that there are clear preferences across the region. And these preferences are still similar to the preferences we saw in 2011, meaning there are still the, the same countries that wanted strong men in power in 2011, support a decision which they see as putting one man in power. And the other countries who supported, um, you know, Islamist led governments in the region still are coming out supporting al Nahda. And I think that's interesting to look at 10 years on. Uh, just to compare the dynamics there. That's all. Thank you very much. Um, I'm. Uh, this question is for um, Tahani. What do you think Haftar's future will be? How is he handling the upcoming election plan? Does Tripoli really trust him? So uh, regarding Haftar, um... Definitely, he uh, lost a great percentage of his supporters, not just uh, in the East, I would say, uh, you know, across uh, the country since June of 2020, when he withdraw, uh, not giving uh, legitimate reasons to his supporters why he did that in the first place. And he failed to conquer Tripoli as he uh, claimed to do several times. In terms of uh, elections, um, uh, he appears to be very supportive through his uh, statements that he keeps uh, issuing every now and then. Um, whether Tripoli trust him or not, that is for sure uh, is a no, uh, based on my opinion and the situation on the ground. Um, especially after his failure, uh, there is the majority of people now think that elections is the only way out. So whether he, after himself, will run for presidency, for example, or not, uh, in my humble opinion, I don't think he will do that. I think uh, he's uh, well aware that his uh, popularity is not uh, as it used to be. So because of that, I would assume he would look for someone else that he would support to run for presidency and then Hafter will have a position in that government, whether to be a minister of defense or you name it. But uh, I do believe that uh, he himself will not run for it, but will will have a candidate to run for it uh, who's popular and he will be supporting him from behind. Dehani, I'm going to give you this other question um, um, because it's actually addressed to you. It's a comment um, about an earlier comment that you made. It's from Abdel Hamid Siam. Tahani said that she did not think there were there was any interference in Tunisian internal internal affairs by UAE. I do not think UAE itself would say that. They are celebrating through their media outlets. They spent millions of dollars supporting anti and Nahda elements. Abir Musa is but an example. What made you believe that UAE is not interfering in Tunisian internal affairs? So just to, a quick response to this. This is what we see, not just the UAE is doing that. Every other country is doing that, not necessarily UAE. I mean, you can even look at, uh, for example, uh, Libya, who is really struggling, but they were for some reasons, I'm talking about the people here, not necessarily, you know, political parties. But because from the, the overall reaction or, you know, the greater image, this was, you know, uh, a victory against uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, for example. Uh, so they, they looked at that and a quick reaction as, you know, this, this is a victory and we should support it. And I think um, this cannot be an indicator that UAE um, has direct involvement in, you know, damaging uh, the economic situation in Tunisia, or how the government dealt with the pandemic, 
or how the government failed to respond uh, or address its citizens' needs. This is completely Tunisian thing. Uh, when it comes to media and promoting things, this is what everybody's doing. Of course, depends on your agenda, which group or you know which part of government or which political party you're supporting. Then, of course, you will be promoting that in particular. And as I said, they uh, they definitely uh, welcome that, whether privately or not, along with you know Egypt and Saudi Arabia, because this serves their interest to limit the influence of uh, a Nahda party. So, regardless, you know. Um, the details, this is something very great for them. I just wanted to say something regarding the, uh, going back to the question of uh, the international community response, um, you know, the US or um, any other, you know, political power you can name. Uh, I just wanted to add to what Khawla said that everybody now is coming and they are like, oh, we want to support, you know, Tunisia and all of that. I get very emotional about this topic because it's definitely the scene and the situation in all the countries went through the Arab Spring, in particular to Libya, it's the same thing. Uh, so we wait, we observe to see who will be the one in control. Then we will intervene and say, oh, we're supporting this and we are with the people. This approach has to change. Unfortunately, it will never. Uh, but this has been the case, even, even with Libya. Um, the social component uh, aspect of things was never the first. It's always about the power struggle and who will be able to manage the ground. Then we will pledge to support that. Um, I, if I can uh, graciously ask all of you to um, um... Uh, give us brief answers because we're running out of time and a lot of questions are coming in. Um, this question, I'm going to turn to you, Dalia. It's from Mariana Lanata, Lund University, Lund University in Sweden. Thank you for the interesting presentations. My question is rather my comment is about the very negative economic impact that the EU Mediterranean partnership agreements have had and have on the development in Tunisia, Morocco, and to a certain extent, in Algeria, as an expert on these agreements, I consider their negative impact as one of the important reasons for the destructive developments related to the labor market, economic investments, etc. Yeah, true. Uh, I mean, uh, in a few words, I, I wrote a chapter on that. It's uh, it's in a in a collective book uh, edited by Adel Abdel Ghaffar. Uh, but very shortly. I think as, ma as long as the European Union will continue to treat Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, Libya as this tough neighborhood. When I say neighborhood, I mean uh, uh, banlieue, like they deal with their, with their uh, local banlieue. As long as Algeria and the North Africa will be dealt as a tough banlieue, a tough neighborhood that they need to, to, you know, to control, we will remain in this very uneven relationship uh, economically. Also, there is no trust between the two rivers, uh, les deux rives, between the two, uh, the, the two, um, uh, the different countries, the Mediterranean in general. And so uh, worse than that, I think not only these economic development are to be also to, to, to they have roots in every country, but European Union have a, a responsibility. I would go further and be provocative for my last comment. And I would say that if things turn sour in these countries, meaning if there is uh, repression in this country, I do believe that the European European Union is likely to turn a blind eye to human rights violation because it is in its own interest to have a very stable North African uh, um, countries rather than having some social upheaval and so on and so forth. Especially, and I will finish on that, that Europeans seems to be done, if I may say, with the Arab Spring 2011. They do not want uh, other waves. You can see it simply by the media coverage uh, when Algerians took up to the street very peacefully in 2019 they had the right maybe for a few weeks of coverage and then Algeria disappeared totally uh, from the international media coverage um, if I can just add to that I would also say that so long as the EU 
conditions its aid and its support so heavily on migration control, these issues will remain. And furthermore, so long as they continue to support economic models that lead to important larger projects that, that do not trickle down to the population, to the classes who are vulnerable, these, we, we will continue to have these problems. And Daya, you're absolutely right. They have also backburned democracy compared to their other goals in the region. And civil societies in Morocco, in Tunisia and Algeria have accused the EU of uh, keeping the burden on them, these civil societies, when it comes to dealing with the political issues and of taking a step back from their authoritarian bodies so, so as not to strain relationships between the two. So it's a very flawed concept overall. Thank you, Yasmina. Uh, this question goes to uh, uh, Khawla, and this comes from Abdel Wahab Al Qassab um, of Arab Center, Washington, DC. Uh, thank you for the interventions. My question is, do you think that the lukewarm personality of the majority leader, Renouchi, led to the unconstitutional, in a way, measures to grab the power? So it's, it's more about the personality of Renouchi. Uh, in Tunis, uh, we said the real coup happened uh, after 25 July. It's what happened uh, with the Ghanoushi and the Nahda party. Because what happened in 25 uh, let the real crisis now is, is in the Nahda party. Uh, people need to know something. It's Tunisia, it's not Ghanoushi, and Tunisia, it's not Nahda party. Tunisia, there is a lot of uh, another parties, and and unfortunately, uh, one of our crises it's because Ranoushi it's in the head of the parliament. It's because Nahda want to have everything, want to lead everything. Ten years maybe it's not enough for Nahda to give opportunity to another people, to another youth, to another organization, to another parties. However, these parties, and and by the way, the people after the revolution year by year and uh, they try to punish Nahda and, and they try to punish the, the politic uh, class in Tunis. Uh, the Nahda, for example, the last, uh, the last election, um, when you compare the last election and you compare the election in 2014, you can see the numbers can tell us a lot of things. But unfortunately, our crisis, one uh, of the reason it's Nahda party, and until now, after the 25th July, the people waiting a real decision, a real, um, a real decision and a real uh, uh, instruction from Nahda. And until now, we have nothing. She tried to, to be OK with this party and to be OK with the other one. So unfortunately, we're waiting something really uh, serious from this party because it's a big responsibility because this party people trust you and you failed them. So you need to uh, go back some steps to let uh, the chance for another parties, for another organization. And unfortunately, I said that uh, Ranoushi is a part of the problem. And until now, we don't like to confess and to say, okay, I'm, I'm a part of this problem. And however, in the constitution, and in the, in the image of the politic um, uh, picture in Tunis. Khawla, let's stay with the constitution. I'll take this question to uh, Dalia, but also about the constitution, Maher Akrami, or constitutional court, more like it. Without the full establishment of a constitutional court in Tunisia, is there even a mechanism by which constitutional violations can be redressed? Furthermore, without the checks and balances that are laid out in the constitution being fully built out, was something along these lines almost inevitable? I know it's a constitutional uh, question and there's a lot of debate about Article 80 of the Tunisian uh, constitution, but... Um, I mean, we need a legal expert to maybe talk about the legality of what happened, but what do you think about establishing a constitutional court in Tunisia to um, lay out maybe a mechanism um, um, to verify these constitutional violations, if any? Uh, um, this question is for me, sorry. I mean, if you can give us a, uh, an answer in one minute, and then I'll, I want to hear Dahlia's. Um... Okay, the Constitution, the Article 18, 
Qais Saeed used the article 18. Uh, this article, Qais Saeed, he, he don't, uh, don't the constitute this uh, article 18. He said, Qais Saeed, he can't make the decision uh, only. He need to uh, agree with the, 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 the head of the parliament, with Ghanoushi, and with the, the head of the government, it's Mishishi, and this is not happened. And the, and the, and the article 18 too, he said, after 30 days, I, uh, the, the, the head of the parliament, Ranushi, he need to take all the process and all the problems to the constitution court. And until now, we have we don't have this constitutional court. And this constitutional court, the problem why we don't have this constitutional court because two reasons: first, the parliament because uh, the problem is inside the parliament. Second, because I say don't agree to sign this uh, to sign this uh, this um, uh, the list of the constitutional court. So the, the, the article, uh, it's not a problem of constitution. It's a, pro it's a problem uh, of the Qais Saeed first. He used the article. He don't, uh, uh, he just used it, you know, because all the letters of this article, he don't do anything. He don't agree with Mishishi, he don't agree with Ranushi, and we don't have a, a constitutional court. So, so legally, it's, it's, it can't be happen like that. And because that, another today, she said, another today after, uh, before two hours from now, she, she described the presidential decision in the evening of 25 July as a coup against the constitution and parallel list of state institutions. So this is the problem. The problem today is the president, he, the article 80, it's clear and it's, it's so clear, there is no problem in the article, there is no problem in the constitution. The problem is, I choose this article and I do what I want with this article. And I say, the article said this. This is our problem today. The problem is Qais Saeed, the professor of law in Tunis. Qais Saeed is, is a, a professor of law and he don't, uh, she, she, he just used the article. He just, this article 80, he take just the article 80. But what inside this article, he don't do anything. He just use it like I have the right to use the Article Eight, and I use it. And you can't judge me, and you can't say anything. And this is my decision, and the people with me. Point. That's it. And there's a lot of uh, legal debate as to uh, the legality, but also the constitutionality, and what exactly is Article Eight all about. Let me uh, uh, take uh, this question, and we do have two more questions that I really want to squeeze in. So. One minute answer, please. Um, this question goes to uh, Yasmina. Has the December Abraham Accords with Morocco had much effect yet, both in Morocco and in the North Africa more widely? Uh, yes. Uh, on many levels, yes, yes. Um, for, for North Africa more widely, you know, now Morocco is the only Maghreb, leave out Egypt state, that has normalized partially with Israel. Um, and it, after the events, after the May crisis and Israeli violence against Jerusalem and Gaza, this divide has become more pronounced, those states that have normalized and those others that have not. And so presumably it is more difficult now to come to terms over a solution or a way to help the Palestinians now that we have this divide. In, in Morocco, uh, there have been more changes. Uh, first of all, the, the agree, well, what was agreed upon in, in the deal with, with the Trump administration has begun, begun to come around. So there are direct flights established by Tel Aviv. Uh, there are uh, you know, investment deals. There's talk about help in tourism and other sectors. And now they just signed the cyber security defense deal, I believe. And of course, Israel's foreign minister will visit in two weeks. And that's a historic visit the first time. Um, on, on the indirect impact, which this question may have been referring to, many argue that Morocco's foreign policy has been emboldened since December 2020, that it's adopting a stronger um, approach towards its, its foreign policy goals and its issues compared to before it had US support. Uh, and since I know I'm just going to end on this, um, I think that you know, it's, it's brought it closer to the Gulf states who, who, who normalized and those who have a friend, had a friendly relationship relationship with the Trump administration and the states that did criticize Morocco weren't you know in its visor weren't the states it was hoping to be close partners with so yes big changes 
I hope that answers your uh, question, Michael Safni. Um, Sanfi, I have to say. Um, and this question goes to all of you, and we're going to end with this. But before I uh, tell you the question, um, there is a question from Coletta Bridges. Thanks for the great panel. Will the session recording be shared with uh, the participants? I hope um, Tamara or Nabil from Al Arabi Center can answer uh, that at the end, maybe. Um, so, last question to all of you comes from Lance Lindbaum. And I think that's basically the question on everyone's mind right now. What is how do you see the Tunisia crisis play out? What is going to happen? What does the future look like? And I know how at the beginning you were saying that Qais Saeed took the country into the unknown. Nobody knows what's, you know, what his next steps are, what's going to happen. That's also shared by uh, the other panelists who see the uh, steps in Tunisia as something, you know, that came out of nowhere and don't know where they're going. Final conclusion, what is going to happen? Start with Khawla and then Dalia, Yasmin, and then Tahani. Um, I always, always there is hope. We can't say it's, it's closed rules. No, always there is hope. When there is hope after the revolution, there is hope because we, are, we have, uh, we still try to protect our liberty of uh, press. We still try to, um, um, our organization, our uh, national organization, we, there is a big hope of, of them to protect our process of democracy, uh, the people in Tunis, however the problems, however the fatigue, but there is always hope of um, a democracy uh, state. Um, and I wish after 30 days uh, until now, the parliament go back again to work. We have a new government, try to fix the economic problems and we continue fighting for our country and for our future. Dalia. Uh, very briefly, I think Tunisia was, is, and will remain the happy child of the Arab Spring. I have full, full, full confidence in the Tunisian people. They have not only the political maturity, but they do have the institution and the mechanism, the right mechanism to protect uh, what they've been fighting for. Yes, Mina. Um, I have to agree with Dalia and Khawla. I, I think that Tunisia has come too far to, for it to end now. I don't see this as the end of Tunisian democracy. Um, how, how I see it, it might play out is that the president will nominate a prime minister uh, and will continue dealing with the COVID situation until the next elections. I think that's the most straightforward manner it will play out. Otherwise, I think there may be a, a dialogue with various actors, including the UJTT to decide on a scenario, but I'm by no means pessimistic about the future of Tunisia. I agree with uh, what everybody just uh, said. Uh, Tunisia has been, uh, a great example historically in dealing uh, with such political crisis. This is definitely uh, a new challenge for Tunisia and the Tunisian people, but I do believe uh, the situation will sort itself out. I expect that as um, Yasmina said that uh, uh, President Qais Saeed will uh, appoint a prime minister and perhaps we will see early elections. Thank you for ending on such a positive, positive, hopeful note. And uh, I do hope that uh, the best will play out in Tunisia for Tunisia and the rest of the region. Thank you, Al Arabi Center, Washington, DC, for this great discussion, for the great um, panel. I am once more honored to moderate a, a panel of all female, all women, all great um, speakers. So thank you. We've covered the situation in Tunisia and the region. Thank you panelists and thank you participants and um, have a great one, everyone. Thank you, Rima, for your great moderation. Thank you all panelists. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. you all. Thank you. Bye.